Okay, let's go ahead and start. We are dealing now with projectile motion. And we said that a projectile is any object that travels under the influence of under the influence of gravity, right? So if I were to take a brick and fling it into the air, it is traveling under the influence of gravity so that is projectile. Projectile. Awesome. Extra credit. Okay. To whoever spoke up. <clears throat> so that is projectile motion. So the projectile is the object traveling through air or through space under the influence of gravity, right? So projectile motion has a combination of x y motion, x motion as well as y motion. So here, if we had a table, right? So here's a table. I have a ball that I roll along the table. The ball rolls along the table and then gets off the end of the table. If you look at just the x motion, what happens is and if we had a strobe light and we take a photograph every fraction of a second, so here is the ball. Let's say one second later, another second, another second, another second, another second. Can you tell me about whether this motion is, is it the ball traveling at the same speed or a changing speed? Is it accelerating, decelerating? Constant. constant speed. Because the distance between the photographs of the ball is constant, right? So it's traveling at a constant speed. Now, this is just the x-axis motion. Now I'm looking at just the y-axis motion. Along the y-axis, I take the ball and I hold it, I let go. One second later, it's traveled a certain distance. One second past that here, another second later, it's down here, and yet another second later, it's down here. Do you notice that the distance between these photographs is increasing, which means that the ball is decelerating? Good job. One person awake. The ball is accelerating, it's not decelerating. To be decelerating, it will be slowing down, rather the ball is increasing in speed as it goes down. Now, if we were to combine these two motions, the x-axis motion plus the y-axis motion, we can do this. Create a grid where we have the y lines, the perpendicular or the vertical lines, are along the positions where the ball was every second. So you can see that these lines are equispaced. The spacing here is the same as here, here, here. However, now we draw horizontal lines matching each of these positions of the ball, right? And what we do is we combine the x motion plus the y motion. So the ball started out here. After one second, it's down here. OK, actually, after one second, it is there. Then it's down here, then here, then here, then here, right? So combining the constant speed of the x motion plus the varying speed of the y motion, you end up with a curve that looks like this, the yellow curve, right? And this is a parabola, right? You all know what a circle is take a circle and pull it, what does it become? An oval and ellipse, right? So an ellipse, now you take any part of the ellipse, a section of the ellipse and that is a yep, parabola, right? So this is a parabola. Huh, what happened? Okay, so I think that, yeah, here. So here's a woman who is getting rid of the stress in her life by flinging rocks at the moon, right? So she flings a rock, so as she flings it out, up as the rock leaves her hand, there is a velocity vector in this direction. This velocity vector can be separated into a y-axis component and an x-axis component. So this speed along the diagonal is split into the horizontal speed and the vertical speed. The horizontal speed to a first approximation, ignoring resistance due to air, stays constant throughout the motion. The y motion is slowed down by gravity, right? As it travels upwards until it reaches the top, then gravity pulls the, the stone down and it comes down. So if you look at these components at each position in this trajectory, at this motion, here is the diagonal. We can separate this diagonal, deconvolve it into a vertical component and a horizontal component. Note that this horizontal component of the velocity stays constant. It's the same length here, same length here, same length here, same length there. We are ignoring air resistance. If we include air resistance, what would happen is this component would gradually get smaller. However, then we'd have to include the effect of the wind as well. If you had the wind traveling against it, the component would get shorter, quicker, or if the wind is pushing the ball forward, this component can actually increase over time, right? So we're ignoring all those secondary effects. So ignoring those secondary effects, we end up with the x component staying the same, the y component 
right? Here's the Y component. Starts out with a large Y component. As it goes up, the Y component becomes smaller due to gravity pulling it down until it reaches the very top where gravity, I mean the effect, the Y component is basically zero. Then as you pull it down, the, the Y component increases downwards and here it's at a maximum downwards, right? In the absence of air resistance, the Y component upwards as it leaves the woman's hand is equal to the Y component downwards as the object hits the ground. Now this is the reason why when you celebrate whatever you wish to celebrate, you don't want to pull out your gun and fire it straight up into the air. Yes? Why? What goes up must come down, right? Which is not always true, but a lot of the times it is true, right? So it's true enough of the time that if you were to fire your gun straight up into the air, you have a reasonable chance of what? The bullet coming back on your head or your neighbor's head or whatever at the same speed to a first approximation that it went up. Right? So, neglecting air resistance. So, neglecting air resistance, you can get as killed dead by the bullet coming down as if you were to shoot the gun directly into your head. Don't do either of those as an experiment, if you will. Right? Okay, parabola. It's the curved path followed by a projectile near the Earth under the influence of gravity, and that's basically a section. It's a cutout, snip out part of an ellipse. So here is an example of a parabola. Here's a cannon. It shoots a cannonball. Now, if there were no gravity, what happens is that the cannonball would follow the dashed trajectory, right? So it travel in a straight line indefinitely. Would this cannonball ever reach infinity? Nope. It's impossible for any, we've been through this before, right? And none of you have actually given me a proof that proves me wrong in stating that the, it's impossible for the physical universe to be infinitely large. It's impossible for the physical universe to be infinitely old. So, extra credit to you if you can come up with your best argument to show that I'm wrong in that statement. On the other hand, if you have a good argument to show, uh, we haven't done it in class. Have we done it in the class? We haven't? No, you signed it. Sorry? You signed it as extra credit. Oh, I signed it. Okay. So has anyone come up with an, uh, with an argument of one kind or the other to show that it is possible or it's impossible to have an actual infinity? Mademoiselle? Well, mathematically, all of our whole math is based on infinity. So any number can be doubled, any number can become smaller. So technically there has to be infinity or our math doesn't exist. Or what we believe that math leads to isn't. Okay. May I modify your statement sure. to make it correct? Um, make before, it <laughs> let's see what Jenna has to contribute. Go ahead, Jenna. Well, isn't there also a theory that you can't ever reach another person because there's always half the distance to cover? Zeno's paradoxes. Right. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's not true. Okay. So okay. <laughs> Good point. Um, okay, Zeno's paradox <coughs> is based, there are a couple of ways to get around G Zeno's paradox. Zeno's paradox assumes that there's an infinite number of steps between this person and, say, if I were to come to you, Zeno's paradox presumes that there's an infinite number of possible subdivisions in the distance between me and you. So before I reach you, I have to cross half the distance to you. And then before I reach you, I have to cross half that distance, right, and so on. So because there's an infinite number of steps to reach from here to there, I will never cross that distance according to Zeno. Now the thing is, I think Leibniz and maybe uh, Newton, when they came up with calculus, one of the things that they showed was it's possible to have an integration of an infinite number of steps, and as long as each additional step is becoming smaller, you can have an infinite integration add up to a finite number. That's used a lot in calculus. So they're showing basically that Zeno's paradox is, is based on that fallacy. Another resolution to Zeno's paradox is an argument that I've seen from a philosophical perspective, which I'm, I don't know, I'm, I, I kind of struggle with that argument. It looks like it may be right. It's basically that space is not infinitely divisible. This is an argument to say that space itself is quantized. So if space is quantized, what happens is at some stage I get to the point where I cannot divide the remaining space between you and me in half again, because space is quantized. So I have to jump from this part of space to this part of space to this part of space to get to you. So there's a finite number of 
of dots between me and you. So does right? that support your theory that, that, that the universe is? It is consistent with the, the concept that it is impossible for an actual infinity to exist physically, right? Now, extra credit to you for bringing that up. Good point. Now, coming back to your point, in math, there's something called an actual infinity, a potential infinity. All of our number systems are potential infinities in the sense that as we count them, we never actually reach a spot that says infinity. It's a potential, it's tending towards. Mathematicians sometimes use the term actual infinity, effectively by saying, I wave my magic wand and here I give you the number set. And that, they call that an actual infinity, but it's not the same as a physically actual infinity. But any number can be doubled. But you never reach infinity. It is always it a finite has, number. But it describes what every doubling is going to. So maybe you can't you can't reach it, but it does. What it's describing so I'll, does exist. I'll ask you. you I'll ask you the question. Going, can we create an infinite number of apples on the earth? And if your answer is yes, okay, we miss you. Well, with that, you know, using that same argument, it's not testable. It's not testable to be able to to create, you know, well, I guess it could be to a point, but... I to create an infinite number of apples? You're saying it is not testable? Well, I had, there is a different course. No, that's interesting. I mean, so you're basically arguing that the hypothesis is not scientific in the sense of testability. Right. Okay. Well, you so can't, you can't really prove that right or wrong if is space infinitely large. We can't prove that because I can. Okay, I'm going to hold off on this discussion and challenge me on it, right? Challenge me on it. This is what to me this is this is exciting, right? And I'm I'm happy to be proved wrong. I'm totally happy to be proved wrong. That's how I learn. That's how I push the boundaries of my knowledge, right? Set up a hypothesis. Do my best to destroy it. If I can't destroy it, I throw it out to others to destroy it. If somebody's able to destroy it, then I change my understanding of the truth, and I move on, right? Then set up the next hypothesis. But I'm going to hold off on that so you guys can think about it and come back for a future class on that, right? So. The answer to this question that I posed here is this cannonball will never reach infinity. It will always travel in a straight line according to Galileo and Newton and so on, right? According to Newton, it keeps traveling on, then where Galileo and Einstein and so on come in would be basically to say that it travels in a straight line on space-time, but the straight line in space-time may not actually be mathematically straight, a uh, different topic, right? So. Now, that's in the absence of gravity. If we bring gravity into account, what happens is the cannonball will not travel along the dashed line, but will travel along this curved path that we just said was a parabola. So what happens is the trajectory is being pulled down by gravity. So in one second, here's one second, the trajectory, right, which is the path that the ball travels, has been pulled down by five meters, which is equal to the distance that the ball would have fallen if you had released it from there in one second. Now after two seconds the trajectory is pulled down by gravity by 20 meters and that 20 meters is equal to the distance that the ball would have fallen in two seconds. After three seconds the trajectory is pulled down by gravity by an amount 45 meters which is equal to the distance that the ball would have fallen in three seconds if we had released it from up there. See what's happening? These numbers, these distances come from the table we saw in a previous lecture where I drop a ball and said one second later how far had it traveled, two seconds later how far, right? That's exactly where that's coming from. Next point, if you had a cannon and you're trying to take out the bad guys and the bad guys happen to be here, what you could do for a certain amount of gunpowder and all that kind of stuff, you could take them out by firing the cannon at 30 degree angle with respect to the horizontal and the cannonball travels over here and ends up here or you can fire the cannon at 60 degrees and you have a higher trajectory but the distance traveled along the x-axis is the same so these two angles they're related as they sum up to 90 degrees right so they are I always mix this up comp complementary angles or supplementary angles it's like 90 degrees minus the other one right so let's say that I were to fire the cannon at 15 degrees to the horizontal, it travels this far. To find out what other angle, I'll take 90 minus 15 gives me 75. So if I fire the cannon up at 75, it'll travel here. Now if you notice, if I fire the cannon at 
45 degrees with respect to the horizontal, you end up with a trajectory that is the greatest distance. So the greatest range is if I fire a cannon or like a gun or a bow and arrow at 45 degrees with respect to the horizontal. This is the reason why if you see the movie Braveheart and so on, I think we've talked about this, you see the armies facing each other and you'll notice that the archers are not shooting directly at the enemy soldiers, they're shooting up at 45 degrees because they're trying to maximize the range. So what happens is if you maximize your range, let's say that the bows on both sides are the same and those guys are shooting directly at you and you're not shooting directly at them, you're shooting up 45 degrees, you can take them out way before they get into range of you, even though they have the same bows, the same power, all that kind of stuff, right? So that's an example of physics in application. <clears throat> so here's a cannon firing a cannonball up into the air. As the cannonball leaves the cannon, it's traveling upwards at 40 meters per second. One second later, it's traveling upwards at 30 meters per second. Two seconds later, 20 meters, then 10 meters, and at the very top, it's traveling at zero meters per second, at least in the vertical direction. One second later, it's coming down at 10 meters, then 20 meters per second, then 30 meters per second, then 40 meters per second. Same thing that we'd mentioned before. The cannonball, in the absence of air resistance, comes down at the same speed downwards as it left the cannon traveling upwards, right? This is why if you look at these movies where you have a cannonball shot from one ship to another, you can see the amount of damage it does in the other, the wood, wooden ships particularly, right? You've probably all seen movies, wooden ship, shooting a cannonball at another wooden ship, goes like way through the side and, right? So this is the case where there's no air resistance. If you have air resistance, what air resistance will do? It'll slow the cannonball down. So what happens is the entire trajectory gets compressed, it gets pushed down because of air resistance. So the cannonball does not travel as high, neither does it travel as far. Right? So what, what's air resistance? Because I mean, we live on Earth and there's air. So mm -hmm. these we don't ideal paths are just like fantasy if there was no air. That's correct. The actual path is what would happen here on Earth. That is correct. Okay. Yes. So the ideal path is a way of thinking about the problem if there were no air. In real life, there is going to be air, there are going to be other factors like the humidity of the air could affect things, right? The direction of the motion of the air is going to make a difference, right? If there is a breeze one way or the other. And so, knowing this, you can then compensate for air resistance or for wind and all that kind of stuff, right? So, um, I think you probably have to do that with, uh, like if you're doing like a sniper rifle or a, like a, just like if you're hunting in this area that you're firing over a long distance, you have to have some sense of the direction that the wind is in. I, I don't have a feeling, I don't, I don't, I mean it's been quite a while since I've fired a rifle. Uh, so I don't have a feeling for how much you'd have to compensate, but I think that if there's a wind in this direction, I would expect that you'd have to compensate a little bit, like if you're target shooting or trying to kill something, right? Okay, so here's an example, an application of these concepts. Here's a presumably lifeguard on top of one of these lifeguard stations and he's kind of bored so he takes a rock and he flings it along the beach because there's nobody to save out there in the ocean, right? He gets tired of sitting around waiting for somebody to save, nobody shows up so he's flinging rocks. So what happens is he flings the rock horizontally. He's, the position to his arm from the ground is 5 meters. The ball travels or the stone travels 20 meters. The question is how fast was the ball thrown. How fast did he have to throw the ball? You all know intuitively that if you wanted to throw, to get it to travel 25 meters, you'd have to throw the ball harder. And if you were, wanted it to reach a distance of 10 meters, you'd throw the ball not as hard, right? So in practice what we do is we try different strengths of throws and get a feeling for how far, right? However, you could do the same thing so that you hit the, the target at one go by actually going through this math. So, we know, we're going to split this problem up into the vertical component and the horizontal component. Looking at the vertical component, we know that distance traveled along the y-axis is half multiplied by g multiplied by t square. This is the table that we saw, right? Ball, I drop the ball, it travels, and as it travels, the distance that it travels is the time in seconds, squared the time, multiplied by gravity, which is 9.8 meters per second per second, multiplied by half, should be equal to the distance traveled. So we know that the vertical distance traveled is 5 meters, not the horizontal distance, the vertical distance. So D equals 5 meters. We know that G is 9.8, or we'll approximate it to 10 meters per second, which means from this expression, time 
t square is equal to half, right? So I can take the half over here to give you 2d, right? The half went there to give you 2d. The g on top went down to give you divided by g. The t square, I can get rid of, the, what is the inverse operation of a, of a square? Square root. So I take the square root, right? SQRT, square root. So therefore t from this expression becomes square root of 2d over g. We've got the distance which is 5 meters, 5 multiplied by 2 is 10, divided by 10 which is 1. So t equals square root of 1, square root of 1 is 1, so the time is 1 second. So if this person, instead of flinging the rock horizontally, were to just hold the rock and let go, it would take 1 second for the rock to drop and hit the ground, since he's 5 meters up. The same thing applies even when he throws it horizontally. It'll stay, still travel for one second before it hits the ground based on the speed and behavior along the y-axis. So we know this ball rock is traveling for one second in the air. During that one second, the question is how far did it travel? 20 meters. So what's the speed of the ball, horizontal speed of the ball? 20 meters per second. Right? See how easy this was once we solved the vertical component, we know how far, how much time the ball is traveling in the air. Once we know how, how much time it is in the air, and we know the horizontal distance, we know its speed is 20 meters per second. What if I were to change this problem, give you exactly the same problem except say that instead of 20 meters, it's, it's 10 meters, it falls 10 meters here. What's the horizontal speed? Good job, extra credit, 10 meters per second. If I were to change this to 40 meters, Horizontal speed? 40 meters per second. Because the amount of time that the ball is in the air is not determined by the horizontal distance. It's determined by the vertical distance which we didn't change, right? In these problems. Okay, now, here's what happens. As you throw the ball with different speeds, the ball travels further and further away from you before it hits the earth. What the Earth is doing also is it is curving away because we, we know that the Earth is like a sphere, right? Really it's an oblate spheroid. But to a first approximation we can think of the Earth as a sphere. So the Earth as a sphere, so as the ball travels, here's the Earth, and as you fling the, the ball horizontally, and as it travels horizontally you can see that the Earth is curving away from the position, the trajectory of the ball. The Earth curves at a rate of about 5 meters for every 8,000 meters. We miss you. This is all second half of chapter Okay. Then I'll just have to put that on the uh, the matching, right? Thank you for bringing that up, extra credit. So second half you said of chapter three? Yeah. Cool. So it looks like they have rearranged this in the, uh, the different editions, right? Yeah. Okay, so for, it travels 8,000 meters, horizontally for a 5 meter drop or in other words if we were to travel 8,000 meters is about 8 it's 8 kilometers which is about 5 miles so if you travel 5 miles this is about 15 feet which means by the time we get from here to downtown Phoenix which is about what 20 miles the earth has curved by a distance of 4 times 5 meters so 20 meters which is about 60 feet amazing like a 6 story building so if you were to like shoot in a straight line and the ball does not come down at all, right, the bullet does not come down at all, just based on the curvature of the earth, by the time the bullet gets to Phoenix, the bullet is like 60 feet up in the air. To a first approximation. All right? So what happens is as we continue to throw these, here's the cannon, right? So here's the ellipse that we talked about. The ellipse is actually most of it is inside the earth. Part of the ellipse is up above the earth, so that is the parabola. So you throw the object, parabola, then the parabola extends as an ellipse all the way into the earth and back up. As you keep increasing the speed with which you fire the cannonball, the ellipses get bigger and bigger and bigger until finally they completely escape the earth. They're completely outside the earth, at which time you now have satellite motion. So if you, if you were to fire this hard enough, you basically will end up with a cannonball going around and around the Earth as a satellite, which is basically what happens when we send a rocket up into space. What we're doing is we get it away from the Earth and then we turn it, right? And get it traveling at a certain speed around the Earth. And it happens that that ellipse that that rocket or space station or whatever is following happens to be one of these ellipses that is outside the Earth. 
that whole motion would be called satellite motion. So, a satellite then is a projectile or a small celestial body that orbits a larger celestial body. So, the moon traveling around the earth, the moon is a satellite of the earth. Ellipse is an oval. Take a circle and pull it, stretch it, and it becomes an ellipse. Now, if you cut a section out of the ellipse, it becomes, that is a parabola, right? So you have all of these slides just for your awareness. You can download them from the website. So it turns out, so let's say that here's the sun and the earth is traveling in an ellipse around the sun. What happens is the way the earth travels around the sun, the earth does not travel at a constant speed. It changes its speed depending on its distance from the sun. So, as the ellipse gets closer to the sun, the earth speeds up. So, let's say that this is the distance that is traveled in an hour. But the earth, the earth travels from C to D in that hour. When the earth is further away from the sun, it travels in this case from B to A. And you can see that, that distance is smaller, right? This is very similar to the roller coaster. We said that when the cars on the roller coaster are near the top, the cars are traveling slower. And when they get to the bottom, they're traveling fast. So this is like the roller coaster. As the earth gets closer to the sun, it's traveling faster. Like the cars on the roller coaster are traveling faster. As it gets further away from the sun, just like the cars at the top of the, of the roller coaster traveling slower, it travels slower. The way it does it, it just turns out that if you go through all of the map, you end up with the earth Tra it sweeps out an equal area in an equal interval of time. So this area here that is subtended by this circular, this triangle with a circle at the end is equal to the area here is equal to the area here for whatever that's worth, right? And that's largely based on conservation of energy applied to satellite motion. So here is the, the sun, there's the earth traveling around the sun what happens when the earth is far from the sun there is a very low kinetic energy because the earth is traveling slower and a very large potential energy and as the earth accelerates comes towards the sun as it gets close to the sun now the earth is traveling faster there's a very high kinetic energy and very small potential energy which is what is driving this so escape speed Escape speed is the speed that's necessary to escape from something, right? So you've probably all seen this here at the mall and here's a little kid and here's the mom and the kid tries to start getting away from the mom, right? What happens? Mom chases after kid, what does the kid do? Fast. Speeds up, right? So what happens is the escape speed is that speed that the kid has to attain to escape the mom. So a kid runs at whatever, two miles an hour, mom can easily catch the kid. Kid now starts running at four miles an hour, mom can kind of catch the kid. Kids start zooming along at six miles an hour, and mom says, "Time to call 911." Right? So they escape. Now, don't do this experiment at home, of course, Mademoiselle. Yes. Time to get a leash. A leash. You're right. Yes. One of those choke callers. Try to run away. I'll zap you. <laughs> right? Okay. You didn't hear me say that. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, that's true. <laughs> okay. I just undid it. Does that work? Sorry, what? Yeah, it's too much work in real life. <laughs> okay, so escape speed. For a projectile to escape the earth, right, you'd have to launch the projectile. So if you were to take a rock and fling it upwards away from the earth, and if you were to fling it, fling it at about 18 miles per second-ish, you will end up with the object going into orbit. So escape speed